Welcome to week two of, well, this is the first question we need to deal with. What am I calling this thing? So last week I decided to call this the Adam Strauss Show. And I will say, I've always been struck by how many very creative people I know and people I don't know, but know of, who uh, call their podcast the most uncreative thing imaginable, which is the, their name show, the blank show. And so by calling this the Adam Strauss Show, by adopting that uh, incredibly conventional convention, what I was doing is, yes, sort of uh, adhering to it, but also undercutting it because, of course, the acronym for the Adam Strauss Show is ASS. And I chose that also because, as I shared last week, I want to lower expectations. Not for anyone else. I don't think anyone else has expectations for me or very few people have expectations for me because very few people know who I am. And the reason, in part, I think very few people know who I am is precisely because I do very few things like this. I don't mean this sort of unscripted share, but I mean I put very little content out there. Though I hate that term, content, as I shared last week. Anyway, I put very little content out there, and the reason I put very little content out there is because I'm scared. I find being on stage with a live audience far more comforting than doing this because with a live audience, there is some sense that I can control how they perceive me, really, is what it comes down to. Of course, that's a delusion. I don't actually know how they're perceiving me, but I can, you know, tap into the energy, read them, adjust accordingly, create something in the moment with them. Or, even if I can't do that, at least I know how it's going in real time. This, I just put this out into the ether, I have no idea how anyone is going to receive this. And this is very scary for me because, as I shared last week, my obsessive compulsive disorder is much better, though certainly can still surface from time to time. But I have one of the ongoing manifestations of, if it's not quite traditional OCD, it's certainly very related, is this crippling, strangling perfectionism that prevents me from sharing stuff that's not perfect. And so by putting out literal ass, it's like, hey, I'm putting this out, of course this isn't gonna be perfect. It's really an exposure for me. And an exposure, if you're not familiar with that term in the context of OCD, is essentially willingly exposing yourself to the feared stimuli so that it loses its power over you. So someone with contamination OCD, someone afraid of germs, would you know, touch a doorknob, then escalate, then they'll touch the floor, then they may touch a toilet seat, then they may stick their hand in a dumpster, doing things that are, even people without OCD might find uh, unpleasant, but they do this, typically under the guidance of a therapist, to get freedom, and that's what this is for me. This is a bid for freedom from the perfectionism that um, has really inhibited my sharing what I wanna share. So uh, I think that's what I'm gonna call this this week. This is no longer the Adam Strauss show. This is no longer ass, though it may well be ass. This is the Adam Strauss exposure. No cheeky acronym, unfortunately, the A-S-E. Week two, because I'm doing these every week until my birthday. Because by the time uh, I have another birthday, I want more freedom. Okay, so uh, I'm coming to you this week in a very different place from last week. Both literally, I am in San Francisco now. Last week I was uh, recording at my parents' place in Brookline, Massachusetts, but more so um, internally. There's been a pretty significant shift I've experienced, a, a very significant, surprisingly significant shift I experienced over the last week. And I would say like probably every significant mental, emotional, spiritual shift. And yeah, the older I get, I'm not sure if you can even separate out those things. Like every significant internal shift I've experienced, this one came in the aftermath of intense pain. The OCD, again, is much better. But as I shared last week, it flared up. Flared up, probably the worst it had been in a few months, over a decision that often does trigger OCD for me, which is traveling. Where should I, or specifically, when should I travel? I fell into OCD about when I was going to come to San Francisco. And when I recorded last week, I'd made the decision. That OCD was behind me. But I woke up the day I was supposed to leave, a little more than a week ago, going to fly to San Francisco that day, and I had an impulse to change my plane ticket. 
And as soon as I had that impulse, there was a part of me that was like, yeah, maybe this isn't the smartest idea. Because OCD, so the most helpful way I've found to view OCD is as an addiction, a strategy to avoid pain that may work in the short term, but then creates more pain. And in fact, one thing that has been instrumental in my recovery from OCD is a 12-step OCD program, Obsessive Compulsive Anonymous, the same as Alcoholics Anonymous. You just substitute obsessions and compulsions for alcohol. And it works, again, because I think OCD, I don't think it's like an addiction. I think it is an addiction. And what we're addicted to in OCD is these ephemeral feelings of safety, of certainty, this feeling of getting it right. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk about, you know, it's about total abstinence. The idea is that someone who's not an alcoholic can safely go into a bar and have a drink or two. But for an alcoholic, it's not just that you can't get drunk. You can't even afford to have a sip of alcohol. And I think that's how it is with me, at least with these very historically triggering decisions like travel, is, yeah, someone else, they could safely decide, hey, I'm going to change my ticket. I'm going to go to San Francisco a day later. There's no reason to not delay a day. And in fact, there were compelling reasons to stay a day, namely to spend more time with my father, whose health is uh, failing, I would say. Someone without OCD, sure, why not? But for me, it's flirting with it. And predictably, it got pretty fucking intense. Just for a few hours, but it was humbling. It was painful. And it wasn't just that decision. What it was is in the days prior, I had seen more clearly, but not for the first time, what I've come to call my addiction to optimization. So the overt OCD, again, historically for me, has been about decision-making, binary decisions. Should I do this or that? Should I travel here or there? Should I go this there or that there? Should I live, should I book this gig or that gig? And that, again, last week notwithstanding, where it flared up, has largely gone away. I'm gonna let these people pass with uh, their lame cliche hip-hop beats. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, yeah, I love hip-hop, but not an original beat at all. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, so that was the OCD, was these very binary decisions that I could get completely trapped in. Generally much better. But what I've come to realize is I spend a lot of time and energy trying to optimize essentially trivial things. Essentially trivial things. Uh, this comes up a lot around decisions that are really related to pleasure. Hiking, what hiking trail should I go on? I could spend a lot of time researching that. And I'm not proud to admit, more than once I've started down a hiking trail and then I've backtracked and gone on a different trail. And as I hear myself say that, I'm like, well, that really is my OCD. It's not just related to, it is OCD. I guess the distinction I'd make between this sort of optimization addiction and the more heavy duty OCD I used to have is the OCD caused great, obvious distress. I would be suffering tremendously when I was in the throes of an obsession. This, the distress isn't so obvious. And in fact, there's a pleasure in it. There's a satisfaction when I feel like I've gotten it right. And there's even a pleasure in contemplating these choices. Oh, well, this hiking trail, I'll get these amazing views. Yeah, but this trail, I'm in the woods. Contemplating both of those possibilities itself gives me pleasure. So this optimization addiction, I think it's persisted because there's not an obvious high cost the way there is for the heavy duty OCD and there is a payoff. But what I saw in the aftermath of this, for me now unusual, but intense OCD I experienced a week ago is, oh no, this optimization addiction is actually a very big thing precisely because it is, it is manageable. It is manageable, it doesn't take over, and therefore, see with the OCD, when it takes over, yes, it's awful, but I know what to do, I know how to get out of it, I identify like this is not something I want, and I take the appropriate steps I need to take to get out of it. Maybe not immediately, because there's a part of me that likes the OCD too. I think everyone with OCD, there's a part of you that gets something out of it, otherwise you wouldn't do it. And in fact, I would generalize that to all what we call mental illnesses, even psychosis. 
There's always a payoff, I believe. That's not to blame the victim here. If anything, it's to increase our sense of agency. There's a reason we get trapped into these patterns, but again, in addiction, what that implies is yes, there is some payoff, at least initially, but I think the reason addictions are so challenging is once you start to get ensnared, it's very hard to get out because they're self-reinforcing. So, yeah, this optimization addiction, seeing that it actually, I pay a price for it because it's kind of there a lot of the time. Maybe not in the foreground, but in the background, but not entirely in the background, of course, because the idea that we are processing things in the background with our mind, that's not really how the mind works. The mind is, um, you focus on one thing at a time. So really what it is for me is my experience often is, okay, I'm engaging in a task. I'm working on something, say. But my mind is continually flicking back to this other thing. Oh, what hike should I go on tomorrow? That's to use this example. And in fact, it consumes a lot of processing power. It's kind of like an app on your phone that, yeah, it's just could taken up a lot of RAM unnecessarily. It takes a lot of energy, even if it's never totally front and center. And it actually does cause anxiety because what's underlying the optimization obsession for me is a fear, a fear of missing out, a fear of not getting things right. And yeah, really seeing this with a clarity. You know, I have seen this before. I have seen this before, but I think the suffering I experienced last week in this acute episode of OCD, I've often found this to be the case, is when the OCD is bad, in the aftermath of that, there's great clarity. And often what that clarity shows me is, hey, you have more OCD than you may realize. Or if not, again, overt OCD, you have more of these, what my friend Jordan calls OCD adjacent tendencies. Let me be real specific. What I mean by this is I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get things right, how to optimize things. And that paradoxically, not paradoxically, ironically, is very suboptimal. I mean, if you spend three hours, maybe not, you know, fully focused, but if for a few hours percolating in the back of your mind is this decision over what hike to go on, that's probably less optimal than not spending that time and not having that anxiety, just going on a hike and maybe having a slightly less beautiful view on that hike. And this too, again, is not a novel realization. I've realized this before, but I've never really tried to get freedom from this optimization addiction because I think I've never really wanted freedom from this optimization addiction. And this raises the question, I would say, for me, why? It's very clear to me that the OCD exists and all this other stuff exists to avoid something. What? I might have shared this last week. I, I can't remember. But uh, when I was 18, I was in a mental hospital for a few weeks. And one of the things that struck me is that everyone else, we'd have group therapy, and everyone else in this mental hospital would share their essentially their origin stories. Why they were there. Some horrific trauma typically, not typically, inevitably, some horrific trauma they'd experienced that had created their ongoing mental health challenges. And for me, it wasn't clear. I mean, there was a specific reason I was there. My first girlfriend had dumped me and I, I had freaked out. I had severe body dysmorphic disorder at that point in my life. I thought I was hideously deformed. It's a whole nother story. Maybe I'll talk about that another time. But so I knew, but then why did I have the body dysmorphic disorder, and even before the body dysmorphic disorder, this pervasive sense that it had from really my earliest memories that there was something very wrong. It's a lot better now, but it hasn't gone away. And even to the extent it has gone away, this way of thinking of trying to optimize things is quite ingrained. And so, yes, even though I've seen it before, I don't think I've wanted to get rid of it because, because there is a payoff. And because I think one of the, probably psychologists have talked about this, but I've never heard anyone else expound upon this idea. So let me put this forth here. I think addictions are themselves addictive. That is, I think 
at least for my addictions to thoughts and, and, and optimizing, there is a meta addiction. There is an addiction to the addiction because, so in addition to the little payoffs I get when I feel like I've gotten things right, there's also this cycle that I, again, I think is addictive. The cycle of the highs and the lows. And when I had really bad OCD, the cycle was much more pronounced. I'd be in fucking hell, destroyed, hopeless. And then finally I would surrender, I'd let go. That OCD crisis du jour, whatever one it was, because I was in constant OCD crisis for so many years, it would lift and I would feel great, I would feel free. So it's sort of like when you have an addiction, instead of living at baseline, there's highs and there's lows. This is me with an imaginary graph. Also, I was a break dancer in fifth grade. Not a very good one. I was kicked out of my break dancing group, arguably for racial reasons. I was the only white kid, but also I was the worst dancer. So, and is there a correlation between those two things? You can decide. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, the cycle of highs and lows. Because sure, the lows suck, but the highs feel great. And also, I think there's something about, yeah, that whole cycle, the intensity of it, the pain, but also the excitement, the drama. And I think that has served to distract me, maybe from some buried trauma, or maybe it's something epigenetic trauma, or maybe it's, I, I don't know, I don't know. But yeah, this optimization addiction, I think, is a way for me to get like a little bit of high, a little bit of, uh, yeah, little hits of high without much of a cost, apparently. But there is a cost. Of course there's a cost. And so much of the cost for all of this stuff comes down to time. The great mystery of this plane of reality. What the fuck is time? Uh, I, <laughs> I have some comedy bits about this. I won't do them here. But yeah, to me, time is, that is the water we're swimming in, in this plane of reality. This is the fabric that it seems like we can't penetrate. And the pragmatic effect of time, of course, is that, uh, well, we don't have, we have a limited amount of it. So if I'm spending a lot of time trying to optimize things, even if it's not front and center, that's time I'm not spending on other things. So this commitment, a week ago, just beginning a week ago, to be free of this addiction to optimization, and using that phrase with myself, it's an addiction. It's an addiction. And praying to what or whom, I don't know. Prayer is a mysterious but in my experience, undeniably effective tool. Because if nothing else, prayer does two things, right? It says, I need help with this. I can't seem to do this of my own conscious willpower, asking for help, which is humbling. And being humbled opens us up. And um, yeah, and it clarifies what is important. What do I really want? My prayer was, please remove this addiction to optimization. And maybe that prayer worked. Maybe that explains what's happened since, because what's happened since has been fairly remarkable for me, which is, well, that prayer was answered. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I'm, it's going to be permanent, but I've had a great deal of freedom. I just haven't been doing it. I haven't been trying to optimize in the same ways. In fact, my mind has been remarkably quiet. I did obsessive Zen meditation for many years, week-long meditation, meditation retreats, uh, you know, the whole deal for like five years. Really intense meditation. But my mind has never been as consistently quiet as it has been for the last week. And what's amazing about it is I see how busy it ordinarily is, how often it's consumed with, well, thoughts about optimization, but also just thoughts, judgments, not liking certain people, liking other people. It's like this dialogue that's constantly passing judgment on reality as it unfurls in front of me. And that's been very, very quiet. And the specific optimization thoughts, I've just been able to kind of let them go, not effortless, not effort, not effortlessly, um, good exposure if I'm making these mistakes, not effortlessly, but with very little effort. Uh, yeah, let me talk a little bit more specifically. So I made a handful of commitments to myself. I wrote them down, things that I want to let go of. One thing is, um, 
well, the optimization thing generally, but there's a lot of, there's a sort of this constellation of associated behaviors that I do. Checking weather obsessively, excessively, trying to decide what day I should go for hikes, particularly when I'm in the Bay Area where there's all this amazing hiking. So I resolve, check weather once a day. Um, also odd things I do that it's not even clear to me how they optimize, but they clearly are not healthy. I check weather in places where I'm not. I don't understand exactly why, but I think it's the same impulse to somehow escape my experience, maybe just with imagination. Because one thing that defines, or defined, because I have had freedom from it, my internal mental life is Wibbly. Wibbly is an acronym I invented. W-W-I-B-L-I, it stands for what would it be like if, and what it is, is essentially imagining myself in some sort of alternate, uh, but possible, not like some you know extreme or fant fantastical, an alternate but possible reality. So I'll be in San Francisco, but I'll find myself checking the weather in New York, and what I'll do then is imagine, what would it be like if I was in New York right now? And imagine, not just with my head, but physically, what sensations would I have if I was in New York right now? How would I feel in the 73 degree weather in New York right now? And then would it be better than how I feel in San Francisco? And if it would be better, maybe I should try to go to New York soon. So no checking weather in other locations. Um, yeah. A lot of distracting noises here. No complaining. This is something Anna, my partner, inspired me with. It's amazing to me. I might have shared this last week. She apparently used to be like me. A lot of judgment, a lot of, um, yeah, complaining. Do I complain more than usual? I don't know, but I could certainly complain. Um, and yeah, in subtle ways. And Anna had her own, had some extraordinarily challenging experiences during the pandemic lockdown. Lost a lot. I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to, uh, I want to protect her privacy. But it led to this profound transformation for her. I've known her for 16 months, a little longer. We just celebrated our 16 month anniversary. And she tells me how different she was before I met her. And one of these differences is she complained a lot and it cost her some relationship she really valued, not just that. And so she stopped. And something she said to me once that really hit home is she said, once I stop complaining out loud, very quickly I stopped complaining in my head. So that was a resolution for me. It's just don't complain, don't complain. Even if I'm unhappy with reality, just don't complain. Another resolution is I've stopped uh, using statements that begin with, I wish I'd, or I should have these regret statements. I wish I'd gone on that hike, or I should have brought this jacket, or yeah. This is turning into exposure for me. I, um, so this is not my first take this week. I did another one of these like two hours ago, uh, but then I just watched it and the sound was all fucked up. It was totally distorted. So I'm doing this again and I'm tired. And now my brain is saying, you're too tired. This isn't good. But again, this is an exposure for me. And an exposure, it's interesting. You know, in regular life, if something feels really, really wrong, we generally take that to heart. You want to adjust course. But with an OCD exposure, if something feels really, really wrong, beautiful. The exposure is working. The more anxiety and exposure evokes, the more freedom you're ultimately going to get from that exposure. So to continue, um, unfortunately, I'm not going to get freedom from these lame quasi hip hop disco beats or this person who I think is just driving around the block. All right. Yeah. The bottom line is I've had a lot of freedom over the last week. I've been able to see these tendencies to complain, to find fault with reality, to check weather obsessively, and I've been able to just let them go with almost no effort, a little bit of effort. It's actually similar to how I first got freedom with OCD. And if anyone watching this, well, if anyone's watching this period, 
hallelujah. But if anyone watching this has OCD, um, yeah, this is something I'd say about that. Is it's the classic bully OCD. It seems ferocious, fearsome, omnipotent. But if you just throw one or two punches, you don't even have to land them full on. It cowers away in fear. That's what I found when I really started getting freedom from the OCD is if I just didn't do the things the OCD wanted me to do, it'd be really, really painful for like five minutes and then it would pass. And that's what it's been like with this. An urge to check the weather in New York, but no, I'm not gonna do it. I wanna do it, I'm not gonna do it. And then it just passes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how long this is gonna last for. I suspect it'll be like any sort of transformative experience I've had where, it, especially like psychedelic transformative experiences where often it feels like you're in a totally new place. And when I first had experiences like this years ago, I was like, oh, I'm in a new place. I'm never going to go back. But no, you do fall back, but not completely. You've had a taste of greater freedom. You know it's possible. You can't ever fully fall back into that, uh, that dream, that delusion, that prison. Anna is certainly hopeful. She said quite a few times, I hope this lasts, which is a little heartbreaking for me when she says that because she wants so badly for me to get more freedom because she loves me. She wants that for me, but of course she also wants that for her because when I am obsessed with something, upset at something, of course that affects her. And that is an additional motivation for me to get more freedom. I don't want to hurt her. And I don't want to lose her, even though, as I shared last week, a part of me does want to lose her. A part of me doesn't want to be in this relationship because of the vulnerability, because it's scary. But that's a relatively small part. And I know I can lose her over this stuff. Because the last time I was really in love, which was 20 years ago, that's precisely why I lost that relationship. My suffering caused her too much suffering. And not in some codependent way, it's just if you're with someone who's really struggling, really suffering, and you care about them, how can that not affect you? I'm dramatically more free now than I was 20 years ago. I'm dramatically more free now than I was five years ago. And actually, to be honest, I'm quite a bit more free now than I was one week ago. But there's still work to do. And I want to do that work for her as well as me. But yeah, I don't think I will be able to quite maintain this the way I have been able to indefinitely, but I think it does feel like I'm in a different place. I do feel a lot of freedom. And I think part of this also, I should say, so I didn't just resolve to give up, um, you know, the complaining and the optimization. I also resolved to give up marijuana. Because my relationship with cannabis, there definitely are elements of addiction. Not in a classic sense. I use cannabis one to three times a week, but in the sense that well, I often will really look forward to the days I'm going to smoke weed. And if it's a day I'm planning to smoke weed and then something changes, I can't smoke weed because some obligation comes in, I'd be very upset about that. And also, weed is a, it is a subject, an object of my OCD often. That is, I often will obsess, should I or shouldn't I smoke marijuana? And it's very related to the optimization thing because weed, that is why I use weed. It is an optimization, at least potentially, right? Because the way I can optimize my experience is by actually changing my external experience. Let me go on this hike. Let me go to this dance party. Let me do this show. But another way is changing my perception of that experience by altering my internal experience, my neurochemistry. And cannabis is a way to do that. And so often I'd find myself obsessing. Should I or shouldn't I smoke? Is this going to optimize my experience? And to be clear, sometimes cannabis does optimize my experience. Sometimes it undeniably makes things better, especially in uh, two of my favorite activities, which are hiking. I find cannabis can enhance my appreciation of nature and dancing. I find it can enhance my ability, uh, well, my appreciation of music, which makes dancing a lot more fun because of course, as I learned when I began dancing relatively late in life, um, 
well, really when I started working with psychedelics 15 years ago, is the key to dancing is not to think about dancing. The key to dancing is listen to the music and let your body move however it wants to move. And when I'm high, I find I can be more absorbed in the music. But yeah, there can be a lot of obsessing about should I or shouldn't I smoke weed? And also there's a sense of something juvenile about it for me. Something like a refusal to engage with reality fully as it is. I guess that's maybe true of, of all substance use. Well, no, I think, I mean, psychedelics can actually enhance one's engagement with hard realities. But yeah, cannabis, I can only speak for myself, I think. Substances are, are they're so idiosyncratic, how they affect people, why we use them. For me, suffice to say, there seem to be benefits to using cannabis, but really this is what it comes down to. For years, I've been saying, well, here's an example. Uh, when I began working with ayahuasca, and, and I, first, I first drank ayahuasca, you know, it was like every other week in New York for a few months, and then I went to Peru and did a retreat where I drank uh, 10 times over a couple of weeks. And coming out of that retreat, I was like, okay, I'm done with weed. I'm done with weed. It just doesn't really help me much. And that resolution lasted four days. And there have been a number of times, quite a few times in recent years where I felt, you know what, I should take a break from weed, just a one month break from weed. But I really, really don't want to take that break from weed. And the fact I really, really don't want to take that break from weed, I know is the biggest reason I should take that break from weed, but I haven't done it. But I have now, I mean, it's been a week, um, but Actually, I'm taking a 30, it was going to be a 30 day break, but when I said this to Anna, she said, why don't you make it 33 days? Because she's very into this thing, this vortex mathematics. I don't know if you know anything about it. I don't really know anything about it, but the repetitive threes have a certain significance. And I like the number 33 quite a bit as well. So I'm on a 33 day hiatus from weed. Cause yeah, like what do I have to lose? Well, what I have to lose is I'm giving up one of my optimization strategies. And I really don't want to give that up, which is why I have to give that up if I want more freedom. And I do want more freedom again because of time. So, um, yeah, that has been the journey over the last week. And I guess that's been the internal journey. I want to say, speak a bit briefly about uh, the external. So I did come to San Francisco a week ago. And the next day, Anna and I went camping in Yosemite and it was exquisite. I haven't gone camping in like 25 years, which I mean, I have like at festivals, psychedelic festivals and Burning Man, but I haven't gone camping in nature in 25 years. And I loved it. Of course I loved it. When I was a kid, camping was my favorite thing in the world. Literally, my family would go on these long vacations to national parks, all of us camping in a big leaky canvas tent together. And I loved it. I loved sleeping outdoors, hearing the sound of insects and water. And that's what it was like in Yosemite just these insect sounds and the water of, uh, of the river nearby. And it was incredible. It was magical. And sharing this experience with her, as she said, this is a new dimension in our relationship. And Yosemite itself. I don't have to sell anyone on Yosemite. Uh, but yeah, believe the hype. It was spectacular. And if this had happened two weeks ago, I'd be going, oh, I should have gone there sooner. I wish I'd, done, I wish I'd been camping earlier but I'm just kind of letting it go. Yeah, that's the big change in my thinking is I'm staying present in a way. All these wibbly thoughts, they take me out of the present, regretting the past, worrying about the future. And for whatever reason, the answer to a prayer, and by the way, an answer to a prayer doesn't have to come from some higher power. It can come from within, and I don't know where it comes from. Whether it was that, just the force of suffering, giving me the motivation to change, whatever it is. Yeah, staying here, the Ram Dass thing, be here now. I feel like I'm able to do that in a way I've never been able to do that before. And it's not like being here now is blissful and joyous. I'm not at that level, I haven't achieved Samadhi, but there's a lot, lot less anxiety and a lot more engagement with yeah, what's happening around me. And what's happening around me is sweet. I love Anna very much. There's a vulnerability that scares me, but I love her. And yeah, being in Yosemite with her, being in nature, like, 
it was just magical in, in every way. So I have another week here with her. Um, magical, but yeah, there is a fear inevitably around this level of vulnerability with her. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's it. I think this is going to wrap up week two of the Adam Strauss exposure. Um, I strongly suspect I will have a new name next week. If anyone has name suggestions, pop them in the comments. Um, yeah, and I will put this out as an exposure, as imperfect as this is. Uh, if anyone is still listening, thank you. Yeah, I don't like that ending. I could edit it out. But if you're seeing me say it, I didn't. All right, take care.